Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Jesse Meyer. He's in the Department of Biochemistry at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, Jesse did his PhD in biochemistry um, in San Diego, and he went to a postdoc in the Buck Institute and then to University of Wisconsin. All three really good uh, places to do biochemistry and omics and uh, very productive groups. Uh, he has been extremely productive with publications. And, and one thing that really stood out to me is that he has the pulse on not only where the field is at, but where it's going. So several times I've gone to the literature to look for you know, an application and uh, Jesse's publications have come up multiple times now for me. He's the recent recipient of a Rising Star Award from the Journal of Proteomic Research. And he has um, three fellowships throughout his training and he's, he's really on a, a great trajectory. So without further uh, delay, here's Jesse Meyer. Thank you. Thanks Kirk for that uh, kind introduction. I appreciate that. And um, good afternoon everyone and thank you all for tuning in today. I'm really excited to tell you about some of our recent work at the interface of omics and data science. But before I get into our recent work, I wanted to just spend a couple minutes elaborating on my group's research vision. So most of my group is focused on mass spectrometry based proteomics, lipidomics, and metabolomics. And that includes new ways to collect data, new ways to analyze data, and then biological applications of those methods. More recently, we've also started working with electronic health records data. And we're really excited about how we can use all of this data either in combination or separately as input to machine learning models that can help automate the production of knowledge. And our goal is to apply this pipeline to enable drug discovery, studies of basic metabolism, and eventually personalized medicine. So let me elaborate on these broad focus areas briefly. When I talk about drug discovery, our goal is that instead of screening drugs against a single target, we want to use complex molecular phenotypes as readouts of drug screens. And we think this will be especially useful for heterogeneous diseases and diseases where the molecular pathology is not well understood. With regard to metabolism, our goal is to collect thousands of multi-omic profiles that we can use to discover hidden modes of metabolic pathway regulation. And understanding metabolism is extremely important because metabolism is altered in maybe every disease. And third, with regard to personalized medicine, our goal is to combine multi-omic molecular profiles with electronic health records to enable early disease diagnosis, accurate disease prognosis, and also enable monitoring of your current state of health. So all of the work that we're doing is motivated by the need to get to these points. And in order to achieve those objectives, there are several challenges that we need to overcome. The first challenge that I see is knowledge extraction from omic data is incomplete. If you've ever done a large scale omics experiment, this might resonate with you. These experiments return a long list of molecular changes and then in order to publish a coherent story, we usually have to focus on a subset of those results. So every published data set has potential for additional knowledge extraction and that potential is largely untapped right now. And we have a lot of plans for how we can leverage this existing data and this first story I'll tell you about is one computational method that enables increased knowledge extraction from existing proteomics data. Um, and this method's called peptide correlation analysis or PCORA. PCORA enables detection of proteiform changes from bottom-up proteomics data. A second challenge is that data collection is still too slow to really produce the scale of data that we need to enable routine application of machine learning. So to collect proteomic data from one sample right now, it takes at least 30 minutes, but probably closer to an hour or 90 minutes or even two hours. And then metabolomic analysis from uh, a sample takes another 20 or 30 minutes. So this rate of data collection becomes a problem if you want to collect thousands of omic profiles from either clinical cohorts or from drug screens. And our solution to this is called direct infusion shotgun proteome analysis or DISPA. And this enables fast proteome analysis. And then a third challenge I see is that clinical data is difficult. And I really struggled to pick the right adjective here, but what I'm trying to convey by the word difficult is that human biology reflected in clinical data is much more messy than the controlled data we get from homogenous genetic models in the lab. Specifically, clinical data is very sparse and it's inherently somewhat inaccurate. For example, we may diagnose someone with a disease today 
and we want to use that data as part of our knowledge extraction studies from their EHR, but we know that their actual disease started sometime before that diagnosis. And that time from disease onset to diagnosis is going to be different for everyone. So today I'll tell you about a recent paper we published that illuminated some of these issues to me, uh, where I contributed models to predict the severity of COVID-19. But let's start by first talking about this project, PCORA. And before we talk about proteomics, we need to establish the complexity of the proteome. So I have pictured here at the bottom of this slide, the central dogma of biochemistry, which is that we know DNA is transcribed into RNA and RNA is translated into protein. We can do some simple math to determine potential proteome complexity based on what we know about cell biology. Recall that we have somewhere around 20,000 genes in the human genome. If each of those genes can produce an average of five transcripts due to alternative splicing, then we could have at least 100,000 transcripts that are possible from those 20,000 genes. We also know that more complexity is introduced into proteins after they're translated through post-translational modifications like proteolytic processing and phosphorylation. So if each of our transcripts could produce an average of 10 proteoforms, we could easily have over a million unique proteoforms that are possible from those 20,000 starting genes. Further adding to proteome complexity, we know that your proteome composition changes with time during aging and even with circadian rhythm throughout the day. And the proteome also varies across tissue. So there's different proteins in your skeletal muscle than there are in your lungs. And on top of that chemical, spatial, and temporal complexity, there's also quantitative complexity, meaning that there's a huge dynamic range of protein concentrations. Compared to genes where you usually have two copies per cell, proteins can be present at zero copies to over a million copies per cell. Um, so although this proteome complexity may seem overwhelming, we know that this complexity is important for human biology. We need proteiform diversity for precise control over metabolism and precise control over tissue function. Still, all this complexity makes measuring the proteome difficult. And as many of you know, this is a huge open field of research and we've made great progress in the last 30 years. The prevailing method to analyze the proteome is called shotgun or bottom-up proteomics. The first step in this workflow is to isolate the proteins in your sample. And to do this, we usually use detergents or urea to simultaneously denature and solubilize those proteins. Next, we add a protease to the sample to catalyze the hydrolysis of those proteins into smaller, more manageable peptide pieces. And that's when the mass spectrometry fund begins. So I'm showing you on the bottom of this slide generally how that works. Most proteomics experiments use a thin glass capillary packed with micron-sized chromatography particles that enables a liquid phase separation of peptides before they're ionized and introduced into the mass spectrometer. The mass spectrometer then surveys the masses of all of those peptides that are eluding from the column at any point in time. And from that intact mass, we can guess what amino acids might make up that peptide, but we can't know their order. So the instrument then selects some of those masses for fragmentation in a process known as tandem mass spectrometry or MSMS or MS2. We can use the differences in masses in these tandem mass spectra to identify the peptides in our samples. And if those peptide sequences are long enough to uniquely match back to a protein that we predict from the genome, we can infer the presence of that protein in our original sample. Then we can quantify those peptides based on the area under their chromatographic elution curve from this column. And then finally, we use statistical testing to determine what protein quantities are significantly different between our sample groups. Let's talk a little bit more about protein quantification from shotgun proteomics experiments to help frame this opportunity that PCORA capitalizes on. Imagine that you have your control and treatment conditions here, and the treatment causes one protein in your sample to double in quantity. When you cut these proteins into peptides and then measure those peptides by mass spectrometry, the starting quantity of each peptide will have a slightly different uh, starting point on the y-axis, uh, and that's just due to the difference in ionization efficiency. But overall, between the control and treatment condition, you would expect that all of these peptides um, have a quantitative increase between these two conditions. Uh, but sometimes what happens is more like this condition on the right. So in this case, imagine that the treatment doesn't change the quantity of your protein, but it induces some post-translational modification like this phosphorylation site. In this case, when we cut those proteins into peptides and measure them by mass spectrometry, it might look like this green peptide is decreasing or going away. 
but in reality, this peptide has just changed in mass. So the, the key here is that sometimes peptides from a protein might not agree with each other. And those peptides might be interesting because they reveal a proteiform difference that is related to some important biology. So this project wanted to ask, how often do peptides assigned to a protein quantitatively disagree? And uh, we needed a way to assess how often they quantitatively disagree um, on whole proteomic data sets. So we developed this method called PCORA, and we published this in the Journal of Proteome Research earlier this year. Some of the data that we used to demonstrate PCORA was previously published in the Journal of Proteomics in 2020. And in this study, they isolated mouse microglia from neonatal mice, and then they treated those microglia from five mice per condition with either a vehicle control, 50 millimolar ethanol, or five nanograms per mil LPS. So LPS is a component of bacterial outer membranes, and this, this condition tries to mimic uh, bacterial infection. The microglia were then harvested after treatment and then analyzed with standard shotgun proteomics. So I downloaded their data and then we reanalyzed it to get peptide quantities that we could use to develop the Cora. Now let me tell you what the algorithm actually does. First, the data are scaled globally so that each replicate will have the same mean and standard deviation centered around zero. Next, the data are centered around the mean of the control group. So in this example, I'm showing you six peptides that all map to one protein called PSMD14. And as expected, their quantities spread out a little bit around the, the y-axis. So with this peptide scaling, we subtract the mean of the control group from each peptide. And you can see in this plot on the right that when we do this additional scaling, it really tightens up the distribution of data, especially in the control group. After the data is prepared, we loop through each peptide with more than one quantified, or we loop through each protein with more, with more than one quantified peptide. And then we set each peptide in that protein to its own unique group versus all other peptides in that protein. And then we fit a linear model that relates the peptide quantity to the peptide group and the treatment group. And we include this term for an interaction between the two groups. And then we can use ANOVA to determine a p-value for that interaction term. And then we can record that p-value uh, before moving to the next peptide in that protein. And then um, after that, moving to the next protein with more than one quantified peptide. And at the end, um, we do multiple hypothesis testing correction to ensure that we have rigorous p-values. So when we apply this PCORA algorithm to the example I showed you before, we find that this one, uh, one of those six peptides that starts with QTT uh, is actually quantitatively different across the groups compared to all of the other peptides in that protein. So this plot on the left shows you the quantities of those peptides, uh, the peptide group or all of the other peptides in the protein on the x-axis and uh, the, the log two peak area on the y-axis. And from the data that's only globally scaled, it's somewhat apparent that this peptide is quantitatively different across these groups. But you can see that when we do this additional peptide level scaling, it becomes even more obvious. And in fact, uh, with this additional scaling, we get a more significant or we get a lower p-value. Now that you know how PCORA works, for the remainder of this section, I'll show you how we use PCORA for um, detection of proteoforms both directly and indirectly. Um, also how we can use it to detect poorly quantified peptides. And then I'll show you an example of how we can use this to detect proteoform changes in plasma from patients with COVID-19 versus controls. Starting with direct evidence of proteoforms, the most statistically significant peptide from PCORA of the mouse microglia data set was this peptide from PKA R1 alpha subunit. And this particular peptide we um, quantified with a methionine oxidation. So we allow variable methionine oxidation in our, our original database search. And you can see from this plot on the left that clearly this peptide is quantitatively different across these groups. It's increased in the LPS, but it's unchanged in the other groups. And none of the other peptides in this protein are altered across these treatment groups. Uh, so PKA is an important regulator of cellular metabolism, and R1-alpha subunit um, actually inhibits PKA until it binds to CAMP. So this oxidation site is actually on the surface of the protein here. And uh, this is entirely speculation, but this uh, site on the surface could potentially alter protein-protein interactions, and therefore it could alter PKA's regulation of cellular metabolism. So again, this is speculation, but this oxidation site that's apparently associated with LPS treatment 
could be a new mechanism that contributes to how PKA regulates uh, cellular metabolism. And this uh, particular change was found with PCORA analysis, but not found in the original data analysis. Next is an example of indirect evidence of a proteoform change. And this time it's in the protein called BAB1. Again, we clearly have a peptide here that was flagged as quantitatively different um, in the LPS group. And this time the peptide is actually measured unmodified, uh, but it actually is known to contain two phosphorylation sites. Uh, so there's a phosphorylation at this tyrosine in position 110, but also um, in serine 113. And previous studies have shown that IL-33 is one signal that regulates the microglial response to LPS. And also that IL-33 stimulation decreases the phosphorylation of BAB1 at this particular modification site. So what might be happening here is uh, that actually the phosphorylation of this protein is decreasing due to this LPS treatment. And that causes the unmodified form of this peptide to appear as though it's increasing. So this is one example of indirect evidence that we might be detecting a proteoform change. Finally, a third type of information that PCORA can reveal is a poorly quantified peptide. So here we have a peptide mapped to calreticulin. Um, and again, you can clearly see that this is different um, in the LPS group. But when we look at the raw data of quantification in Skyline software, we can see that in fact, this peptide is not well quantified. So if you're not used to looking at data in Skyline, um, this shows you the predicted pattern of this peptide's isotopic envelope. And when we look at the quantified peaks across all of the samples, we can see that maybe four of the samples are well quantified. They have a similar pattern and the similarity score is close to one, which is the maximum. But when we look at all of the other samples, we can quickly see that the pattern is nowhere near the expected pattern or the predicted pattern, and the score is, is very poor. So this is very clear and easy evidence that this peptide was not correctly quantified across all of the conditions. And this suggests that this peptide should not be used to calculate the quantity of calreticulin across groups. Now that's great that we can find proteoforms in proteomic data from cultured cells, but what about human plasma? We hypothesize that there might be many detectable proteoform changes in human plasma because of two biological systems that require proteolysis and occur in the blood. One of them being the complement system, which is involved in immunity, and the second being the coagulation cascade. So when we applied PCORA to a recent study of plasma proteomic data from COVID and non-COVID patients, we found many examples of proteoform differences. And this plot gives you an overview of some of the major proteins um, and the enriched GO terms that those proteins uh, fall into. Uh, so in this plot, the large circles are the, um, the functional categories, the, the gene ontology terms, and then the small circles are the actual proteins that connect to those gene ontology terms. And as predicted, we found many proteins that are involved in the complement system down here in the bottom left. Uh, but interestingly, we also see many of proteoforms that are um, involved in uh, the lipoprotein pathway here, for example, ApoB and ApoA. Um, but as expected, uh, we also saw a number of proteins in the coagulation cascade. And if we zoom in on one example of a protein that's important for clotting, this alpha-2 macroglobulin here. This part um, we actually found after publication, and this slide shows you just one example of a peptide in A2M that was flagged as significantly different by PCORA. Um, and although the difference might be really slightly apparent uh, from the, the plot on the left, it's, it's not nearly as clean as what I showed you before. What really stood out to me is this group of outlier points down here at the bottom, where 12 COVID positive people had really low quantities of this proteoform. And as part of this data set, we also have a measure of COVID severity. And we wondered whether this proteoform was associated with severe or less severe COVID. So on the right, I'm showing you now the same peptide quantity data on the Y axis, but now the X axis is the data split according to that patient's um, severity score. And I'll, I'll tell you more about that score um, in the third section. Uh, but I've colored uh, this group of points lime green if they were in the outlier group and they also were in the more severe group based on being below the median for this severity score. And from this, hopefully you can see that actually 10 out of 12 of these people with this particular proteoform um, had more severe COVID. So this might be an example of a proteoform associated with more severe COVID. And if this were to be confirmed with further experiments, then this could be used as a marker to prioritize COVID patients for more aggressive treatments. 
So to summarize this first section, I'm really excited about how PCORA is a key enabling technology that can get us closer to these long-term research goals of understanding basic metabolism and achieving personalized medicine. I think there's a huge opportunity to apply PCORA to look for proteoforms that are specific to disease states um, or proteoforms that might help define disease prognosis. In the second section, I'll tell you about our new fast proteomic data collection method, DISPA, uh, that we plan to use to increase the rate of proteomic data collection and really enable the application of machine learning for uh, multi-omic data integration. First, let's take stock of where the field of proteomics is right now. In my view, modern proteomics started about 30 years ago with the introduction of soft ionization methods that enabled for the first time a transfer of large biomolecules from solution into the gas phase. Uh, and there are many important milestones over the years that I'll skip here, but what I wanna highlight is that the rate at which we can quantify proteins per hour has been steadily increasing over the last 15 years. So in 2008, uh, a group reported that they could quantify every protein thought to be expressed by yeast uh, by mass spectrometry. So there's roughly 4,000 4, proteins that are thought to be expressed in yeast at any given time. And this analysis required roughly 40 days of data collection, which corresponds to a rate of five proteins quantified per hour. Fast forward only four years in 2012, another group reported that they could quantify those 4,000-ish proteins in about four hours. So that's a rate of 1,000 proteins per hour. Two years after that in 2014, another group reported that they could do this in about just over one hour for a rate of 3,500 proteins per hour. And in 2018, uh, I think Jesper Olson's group uh, reported that they could quantify uh, 6,000 proteins from human samples in about 30 minutes. So that's a rate of over 10,000 proteins per hour. However, even if we use this method from 2018 to quantify proteins from 10,000 samples, it would take at least 30 weeks or over half a year. So even that is too slow to collect the amounts of data that I think we need. And this is the motivation for our new method called direct infusion shotgun proteome analysis or DISPA. We published this in Nature Methods at the end of 2020. And to make this very clear how standard proteomics experiments pictured on the top of the slide differ from DISPA pictured on the bottom of this slide, the key difference is outside at the front of the mass spectrometer. So instead of using a capillary filled with chromatographic stationary phase particles, DISPA uses no liquid phase separation and instead adds an additional dimension of gas phase separation by this ion mobility device called FANES. And this is really important because LC separation takes on the order of minutes uh, or usually hours, but infusion and ion mobility can take um, seconds. For the rest of this section, I'll tell you about protein identification and quantification with DISPA. And then I'll give you a couple examples of where we applied DISPA to study mitochondrial function, including one example where we validate the method by observing some expected changes, and then an example of how DISPA can reveal new biology. And then finally, I'll share a new software tool that we published to make DISPA analysis easy. So first, what proteins can we follow with DISPA? In the original manuscript, we identified up to 550 proteins from about 2,000 peptides. And what's really cool is we can do this at a rate of about three proteins per second. We performed a keg pathway enrichment analysis to look for functional pathways in those identified proteins. So each of these circles represents one enriched keg pathway. The number in the circle indicates how many proteins were identified in that pathway. And the proportion of the circle that's filled in tells you how much of the pathway that number represents. So for example, we found 46 proteins in the ribosome pathway, and that's about a third of all the proteins annotated in that pathway. So from this analysis, you can see that we identify many proteins that are important for protein synthesis and degradation, but also proteins that are important for metabolism, including glycolysis and the TCA cycle. And this box on the bottom right refers to um, structural proteins in the cytoskeleton. So in summary, DISPA enables a fast bird's eye view of the proteome in under five minutes per sample. And we find many functionally important proteins that reflect the cellular state. And I'll show you how that can be useful later. Now, let me tell you how we quantify proteins with DISPA. We grow our cells in 96 well plates, and then we can treat those cells with chemicals or vehicle controls. The cells in this plate are grown in normal, natural abundance, arginine and lysine. 
And then in parallel, we grow the same cells in media containing heavy isotope labeled arginine and lysine. Human cells cannot make their own arginine and lysine, so they have to incorporate the versions that we give them into the proteins that they make. So then when we make the lysis buffer, we add some of our cells that are grown in this heavy media to the lysis buffer first, and uh, that serves as a heavy proteome internal standard. Uh, then we add that lysis buffer containing that heavy proteome to uh, each well of our 96 well plate. And we perform a standard proteomic sample preparation and then analyze the samples with a targeted version of DISPA. And then when we analyze the data, we compare the signal from our light proteome, which uh, was our drug treatment, to our standard heavy proteome. So in this experiment, if the light signal is lower than heavy, it means that the compound treatment decreased that protein. If it's higher than heavy, it means that the compound treatment increased that protein. And if it's roughly the same, it means that there was no change induced by that drug. To demonstrate the power of this approach, we designed a multifactorial experiment that would not be realistic for traditional proteomic analysis. We used a total of nine mitochondrial toxins or two controls. And then for each of those, uh, we treated one of two different cell lines, either a wild type or a single gene knockout in 293T. And then each of those genotypes was further grown in either traditional DMEM or human plasma-like media. And then on top of all that, uh, each condition was grown in triplicate wells in the plate. So in total, this experiment has 44 conditions and with three replicates per condition, that means we had 132 total samples. This slide shows you a 30,000 foot view of all of the results from this mitochondrial function screen in the form of a heat map. There are over 45,000 unique pixels in this heat map corresponding to protein measurements. The color of each pixel reflects the ratio of light over heavy, uh, where yellow shows a high ratio and blue is a low ratio. And each row gives the protein values for one of the 132 replicates. And then each column shows the relative quantities for each of the 341 quantified proteins. The amazing part of this experiment is that it took less than five hours of mass spectrometry time to collect these 45,000 protein measurements. So that's a rate of over 170 proteins per minute or nearly three proteins per second. So this shows you that the method is a fast way to get a proteomic phenotype from a large number of samples. Now let's dig into one example of how this fast analysis by DISPA can reveal some known biology and build confidence that this method is useful. One of the toxin treatments we use is called deferoxamine or DFO. Uh, and this is known to be an iron chelator and it increases glycolysis and decreases respiration in cultured cells because cells need iron for respiration. So in this experiment, we quantified nine proteins that were involved in the glycolytic pathway and those are listed in the center of this slide here. And if we look at how DFO treatment changed these quantities of these uh, glycolytic proteins in wild type cells in normal media, uh, we can see that eight out of nine of these proteins were statistically increased compared to the controls. Uh, and again, this is using our DISPA technology. But remember, I told you that uh, in this experiment, we also have a second media and a second genotype with both of those medias. So when we look at these other conditions, we can see overall there's the same trend where most of these proteins are upregulated, but um, some interesting patterns also appear. For example, it appears that uh, pyruvate kinase is only upregulated in the DMEM and it's not upregulated in HPLM. So altogether, this ability to find known biology gives us confidence that we can trust DISPA to help discover new biology. And here's one example of how DISPA suggested new biology, which was a decrease in mitochondrial content in our mutant cell line. So in this plot on the left, I'm showing you quantification of one protein by DISPA, uh, citrate synthase. Uh, the blue dots are from the wild type cells and the orange dots are from the mutant cells. And the plot on the left shows cells grown in DMEM and the plot on the right shows the cells grown in HPLM. So each group along the x-axis is either the 24-hour control or one of the 24-hour treatments. And from this, you can see that four out of eight of these comparisons were statistically different uh, between the wild type and mutant. And this is interesting because citrate synthase is a marker for mitochondrial content. It's a protein that's required for the TCA cycle. So this result suggests that mutant cells might have less mitochondria than wild type cells. And to confirm this result, we used uh, what's called a seahorse metabolic flux analysis to measure oxygen consumption rate. And oxygen consumption is primarily driven by the mitochondria. So if you're not familiar with this experiment, again, the only thing you need to notice is that the wild type cells in blue 
always have higher oxygen consumption than the mutant cells in orange. And this supports the idea that the mutant cells have decreased mitochondrial content. So altogether, this is a nice example of how DISPA can help us discover new biology. And I encourage you to check out the paper for a lot more detailed analysis of that large-scale mitochondrial toxin screen that uh, was a little too complicated to put in the presentation. Uh, but I wanted to finish this section by talking about um, uh, kind of an add-on paper that we recently published. Um, no one had ever collected proteomic data um, in this way before, so a significant part of the original publication was describing a new data analysis strategy that we devised for DISPA data. And that original implementation of that strategy was very manual and it would not be easy for new labs to implement. So one of the first things that we started working on in my new group uh, was a software package to analyze this unique type of mass spectrometry data. And on the left, I'm showing you the paper that we published, uh, I think September 1st in analytical chemistry, describing this software. And then on the right, I'm showing you the graphical user interface that we developed to ensure that this analysis would be easy for people. And while we were working on the software, we found some um, creative ways to make the analysis better. Uh, first, we found that if we combine the query and library spectra, we can make the analysis exponentially faster. So this spectral pooling concept is similar to a strategy that um, uh, was published by Alexei Nesvinsky's group in Michigan, uh, and, and that's in a database search algorithm called MS Fragger. But the idea is that if we combine many input spectra and their possible matches into groups and then index them, uh, this can drastically reduce the time complexity from um, n times m to n plus m in big O notation. And in fact, when we compute the time it takes to search each spectra without pooling in orange versus with this pooling in blue, we see that there's about a 100x increase in the search speed. Uh, so this y-axis is in, in logarithmic scale. We also found a different way to score the spectrum matches that increased the number of peptide and protein identifications compared to the original software tool that I used, that, which was called msplit DIA. And um, in fact, we showed that this helps us identify more peptides, more proteins, but it also works for um, standard LCMS-based DIA proteomics data. And in fact, when we combine all of these improvements with an updated spectral library format that we support with our software uh, called TRAML, we're able to um, double the number of peptide identifications from the exact same data that we published in that original paper. And when we add on our new model uh, Explorus 240 mass spectrometer, and along with these algorithmic improvements, we can identify now um, almost double the number of proteins we originally reported. So we can get over a thousand human proteins in only about three minutes. And that's unpublished. We're working to, to publish that now. So to summarize the second section, we're really excited about how DISPA is a key enabling technology that can uh, really allow us to collect that high throughput proteomic data and get us closer to all three of these long-term research visions. In this last section, I wanted to tell you about uh, some work we did uh, to predict the severity of COVID-19. This is a project that was part of a paper we published earlier this year in Cell Systems. And for this project, we worked with a critical care pulmonologist at Albany Medical Center in New York. We recruited 128 patients who were admitted to the hospital with moderate to severe respiratory issues. And 102 of them were COVID positive and our 26 controls uh, were COVID negative. So our controls had severe respiratory issues as well. We collected blood from these patients and then we separated that blood into plasma and leukocytes. And then we performed a multiomic analysis. And we combined this with patient metadata into a relational database. And we performed a number of different analysis of this data. And we also made the data available through a web portal that you can access right now. This slide gives you an overview of the multi-omic data that we collected. So from the plasma, we were able to quantify up to 517 proteins, over 100 polar metabolites, and over 600 lipids. And we also quantified nearly 3,000 unidentified metabolite features. From the leukocytes, uh, we performed RNA-seq and we measured over 13,000 transcripts. So most of the paper explores these data sets and the relationships between ohms. Uh, but I was really excited about how we might use this multi-omic data to predict the severity of these COVID patients. To measure the severity of COVID in these patients, we used a composite outcome score called Hospital Three Days, which might be familiar to clinicians in the audience, but I found it confusing at first, so I wanted to explain it here. 
Hospital free days means how many days you were out of the hospital within the 45, peri the 45 day period of the study. So this outcome is sort of proportional to one over the severity, where zero days means that you never left the hospital and 45 days means that um, you left immediately. So that's the least severe. And this, um, this bar plot shows you the distribution of the hospital free day values for the people in our COVID group in red and the non-COVID people in blue. I used these multi-omic measurements from COVID-19 positive patients and trained machine learning models to predict the severity of COVID-19. And uh, when we do machine learning, uh, many of you know that we use part of the data for training, and then we assess the model performance on another part of the data called the test set. So in this study, I randomly took 80% of the patient data, and I used five-fold cross-validation to optimize the model parameters. And then I used the optimized model trained on that whole 80% uh, to assess performance on that other 20%. Before we get into the model results, I wanted to just briefly introduce some model performance metrics that we'll talk about. First, for the regression, we'll talk about R2 score or R squared or the coefficient of determination. Uh, this is really the proportion of the dependent variable that is predictable from the independent variable. And then for classification, I want you to focus on the F1 score, which you might not have heard of. Um, but I, I like the F1 score because it focuses on our true positives and it balances those against both false positives and false negatives. So in both cases, a score but close to one is, is best. First, uh, we tried to use re regression to predict the exact number of hospital free days from an input of all of that multi-omic data. And um, I tried these eight different machine learning models that I'm showing you here, the average um, R2 score metric for each model across the five validation folds. Uh, so again, for this metric, close to one is better. And from this, you can see that the extra trees model did the best. In fact, uh, very often I find that extra trees does really well out of the box for a lot of tasks. But remember, I showed you that um, this, uh, this hospital free days is a non-normal distribution. Uh, and whenever we looked at these predictions versus the true value, uh, we weren't really satisfied with this. So this is on the bottom showing you the predicted hospital free days versus the true hospital free days. So we decided we wanted to convert this problem to a classification problem of severe versus less severe. And when you think about converting this continuous measurement to um, two discrete groups, you can imagine drawing that line at multiple different um, points. So in order to convert the continuous measurement of HFD uh, to groups of severe and less severe, um, I, I did what I think was a, an interesting experiment um, where I trained separate models for each possible threshold of the possible groupings. Uh, from, from each value from day one to day 34 as a cutoff. And I think this is cool because in, instead of just setting a threshold, we can ask the data, where is their signal that differentiates two groups? So in this plot, uh, each line shows you the value of one model metric um, on the y-axis, and the x-axis uh, shows you the threshold that was used to split the groups. And the colored spread around each line gives you the standard deviation across the five folds that were used for cross-validation. So really, there's something like 170 models uh, that went into making this plot. And what I want you to notice is that there's a jump in the performance with this cutoff in the low 20s, around day 24. There's actually a local maxima in the F1 score. And uh, this pattern of performance with different day cutoffs is interesting if you remember the distribution of hospital-free days. Uh, you'll notice that there's actually um, a, uh, the thresholds from 0 to 10 that try to predict the zeros from all other people don't lead to effective predictions here. When we look at the models trained on each omic set separately uh, with the same analysis uh, for each threshold in hospital free days, we can see that each of these subset models shares that local maxima at 24 days. And another interesting thing that we can see from this is that different omic data sets differentiate the groups of patients differently. For example, the lipid omic data does well for pretty much any threshold, but the transcript omic data does poorly for the low thresholds versus the high thresholds. And um, actually, this analysis didn't make it into the paper, so I'm glad to have the chance to, to share it with you here. But overall, I think this is important because it gives us a principled way to split our continuous measurement into groups that uh, we can use for classification. And in the end, uh, we decided to go with a cutoff of 23 days, which is actually the median value of HFD across the data set. Now let's look at the overall performance of our classification models across these different metrics. 
And this is also split by the different subsets of training data that I, I was able to use. So when we compare these metrics uh, with these different input data sets, it's interesting because it can give us an idea if there's a different clinical utility across these different classes of molecules. And from this F1 score, um, this might suggest that the transcriptomic data from the leukocytes um, is actually the best or better than the other data sets. And, and maybe you would think that the proteomics is actually the worst. Uh, when we look at other metrics, we see a slightly different picture. So this is the average precision score in the AUROC we can see that now the multi-omic data does the best and, and the other ones are sort of performing similarly. So it's important to look at multiple metrics to interpret these kinds of models. Another way to look at the model performance is to visualize the actual patient predictions. Um, so here I'm showing you each of the 20 patients in that test set where the x-axis shows their uh, hospital free days, their actual value of hospital free days, and the y-axis just separates them in order. Uh, the gray color indicates the less severe group and the red color indicates the severe group. And if the model got that prediction correct, it's a circle. And if the model got that person wrong, it's an X. So from this, you can see that the model performed well overall, correctly predicting 16 of the 20 patients uh, or correctly assigning them to severe or less severe groups. Uh, and that corresponds to an overall accuracy of uh, 80%. Um, and I found it interesting that from this analysis, you can see it gets two of these people at the margin wrong. Um, so maybe it's, it's struggling with uh, that, that boundary a little bit. A third way to look at the model performance uh, is with receiver operator characteristic curves. So if you aren't used to looking at these, uh, a perfect model would be a right angle straight up along this axis and, and straight over. Um, and a random chance would be given by this diagonal dotted line. So as a baseline, we trained a model using only the patient's Charleston score as input. Uh, and the Charleston score is a measure of their comorbidities. And this model gives us a AUROC of 0.69. In comparison, our model using multiomic data achieved AUROC of 0.95. And when we add the Charleston score to that multiomic data, we don't really see an improvement. Uh, so this result was important because it shows that our model using multiomic data is, is much better than using this clinical score as a predictor of COVID severity. Now it's great that the model works well, but one additional benefit of using a tree-based model uh, to make these predictions is that we can easily ask the model what input features were important for making these predictions. And when we do this, we found a set of biomolecules that were important for predicting COVID-19 severity from each omic data subset. And, and the molecules that we found with this analysis were actually complementary to those that we found with other analyses in the paper. So from the proteomic data, we found that this protein tennyson 4 uh, which is an extracellular matrix protein uh, that might be involved in angiogenesis, this was the most important predictor of severity. We also see um, S100 proteins, which are known to function in inflammatory pathways. From the metabolomics data, uh, we saw, interestingly, this uh, quinolinic acid and kynurenine uh, which are known inflammatory mediator metabolites. And in the lipidomic data, we see that this cholesterol ester uh, was the most important predictor for severity. But we also saw two sphingomyelins, uh, which I thought was interesting because those are predominantly found in the myelin sheath around neurons. And then finally, from the transcriptomic data, the most important transcript was this GRB10. And that encodes for a protein that modulates cell responses to insulin receptor and insulin-like receptor. So overall, the molecules that we found to associate with COVID-19 severity by this model interpretation, uh, like I said, they were complementary to the molecules that we found with our other methods. And then finally, I just want to reiterate that as part of this project, um, Ian Miller, Ian Miller uh, a data scientist in the group, set up a website to make this data available for anyone to explore. And I encourage you to check out covidomics.app to explore this data yourself. To summarize the third section, um, we're really excited about how we can use the knowledge gained from this COVID-19 study uh, to enable new translational projects that combine multi-omic data with electronic health records data and help us enable personalized medicine. If I could do this again, I would really like to explore more. The, um, instead of just Charleston score, I'd like to explore more um, how beneficial other components of the, the chart might have been useful in, in making this prediction. To summarize my presentation overall today, I told you about our fast proteomics method called DISPA and how that can enable uh, proteomic throughput that's required for drug discovery and clinical cohorts. I also told you about our algorithm PCORA, 
that enables discovery of proteiform differences uh, in bottom-up proteomics data and how this may have revealed a proteiform uh, of A2M that could indicate high risk of severe COVID-19. And then finally, I told you about how we can use multiomic patient data as input to machine learning models to predict the severity of disease. And um, that this, this kind of strategy might help prioritize patients for aggressive treatments, like for example, the new Pfizer pill. That concludes my presentation. I would like to acknowledge the people who helped with these projects, including the current members of my lab. So um, Caleb Cranny was a talented uh, undergraduate student who uh, worked with me to develop that Zodiac data analysis pipeline for DISPA data. Uh, Caleb now started his uh, master's program at the University of Utah. Um, Quinn Dickinson has uh, been a talented uh, student who helped me set up and maintain the lab. And uh, he's really pushing forward a project uh, on discovering interactions between metabolites and proteins that I didn't have a chance to talk about today. And Amanda and Yuming are postdocs that I recently hired. Uh, Amanda will lead uh, projects related to electronic health records. Uh, she has a really unique background in uh, clinical problems and um, she has a, a strong interest in using EHR to help solve those clinical problems. And, and Yu Ming will push forward uh, some multi-omic data collection projects that we have ongoing. Uh, most of the DISPA project was work that I did while I was still a postdoc in Josh Kuhn's lab at UW-Madison. Um, so I'm really grateful, for, uh, grateful to Josh for giving me the space to develop my own independent research vision. And um, during this uh, time and, and in this project, uh, I worked closely with Alex Hebert and we collaborated with uh, Natalie Niemi and Dave Pegliarini, who are both now professors at WashU. Uh, for the PCORA project, uh, that's work that was done with uh, Maria Dermott, but also Trenton Peter Clark, uh, Peters Clark and Evgenia Shishkova. And uh, the COVID severity prediction uh, was also done primarily in Josh's lab. Uh, and uh, that was done with the critical care pulmono pulmonologist, Ariel Jaidovich, and uh, it was really pushed uh, by Katie Overmeyer, and uh, we had a lot of contributors, Ian Miller, Matthew Bernstein, and Ron Stewart. Uh, it was a great team that we assembled to work on that project. So um, a lot of this work was funded by this T15 fellowship uh, that I had when I was a postdoc at UW-Madison, but um, I'm really excited to announce that we were very fortunate that we were recently awarded an R21 grant from the NIA to apply these technologies and these ideas uh, for drug discovery in the context of Alzheimer's disease. And we're also awarded an R35 MIRA award from the NIGMS to develop and apply technologies related to this for studies of basic metabolism. Um, if you have any questions that we don't get to today, please feel free to reach out to me uh, by email or on Twitter. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and your attention. I really deeply appreciate this opportunity to share my work with you. And I hope that I have a chance to work with many of you in the future. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that um, anyone has. I, I have a quest, question, Jesse. This is Kirk Jansen. Hi. Hi. Did you, um, did you look in your COVID um, proteomics data using your your per core A algorithm for indications of fibrinogen um, cleavage. I know D dimers are through the roof in COVID patients. I'm wondering if that signal came out in your analysis. Yeah, uh, so there were a lot of changes in fibrinogen. There was there were a number of peptides that were altered in fibrinogen. Um, I didn't look very closely at it. I didn't figure out if it made sense with regard to the uh, the endogenous cleavages that you would expect uh, for for D-dimer formation and stuff like that. So there was a lot of signal there, but we didn't really dig into it. And that's one thing that I was hoping we could kind of follow up on. I've been talking to a couple of researchers about how we might better leverage the analysis to produce follow-up studies. Very nice. Um, I had a question. So thinking about kind of how you take multiomic profiling and use it for um, precision medicine, is your vision there that you would really have like uh, clinically appropriate um, tests for each of the omic profiling layers? Or do you think that's kind of like multi-omics is the start and then you identify kind of promising biomarkers from a single ohm that can be put to a clinical platform? Like, how do you see that going? Yeah, I think the, 
the likely path is that you would do discovery experiments and, and try to find certain targets or, or maybe a subset of targets that you could make a small panel out of. Um, of course, I would love it if we could have a full profile in the clinic, but I, I, don't, I don't think the path to regulatory approval is as clean. It'd be much easier if you had a, a small set of targets that you find from a discovery experiment, and then you develop an ELISA assay, for example, and, and bring that to the clinic. So um, I think that's an easier path, but I think it would be, it's possible that we could get to a more untargeted analysis. I just don't see that happening first. I think it would probably have to follow a more targeted panel, panel first. Uh, <clears throat> maybe building on that a little bit, um, one of the issues for uh, regulatory approval for mass specs has been reproducibility, which has been really challenging, sample handling, all that stuff. Um, and I apologize for missing the beginning of your talk. I had to I had to teach. But can you talk a little bit about reproducibility issues in DISPA? Yeah, actually, um, reproducibility is super important. You're right. And it, we haven't quite figured it out to the same level as uh, the genomics uh, groups. Uh, they, they do a much better job in genomics. Um, that was actually one of the questions that we got from a reviewer um, when we submitted DISPA. So actually, I looked at this um, as part of our revision. Uh, so on this slide, I'm showing you the reproducibility of 100 replicate injections of the same sample uh, for DISPA analysis. And what I'm trying to show you on the left here is that um, all of these uh, total ion chromatograms look almost identical across the samples. And then when you overlay them, the signal is extremely reproducible. This doesn't address what I think are some major challenges in uh, reproducible sample preparation. Um, that's, that's clearly not addressed here because this is the same sample injected over and over again. I think uh, it's, we're just not standardized enough across groups. Uh, you know, there's slight differences in the amount of trypsin you add or how long you incubate it. And those differences can have a huge impact on the production of peptides and, and the quality of peptides that you generate. So to get to more reproducible proteomics, I think we need a lot more standardized protocols. And, and part of that is the generation of kind of, we're seeing, we're starting to see kits, you know, we're starting to see the, the kind of kit uh, commoditization of, of proteomics. And um, as someone who's been doing proteomics for a while, I, I tend to not want to use kits, but I think it's important to, to help make things more standardized. If nobody else, I have a second question, completely different, uh, about PCORA. And so you, you suggested there were a pretty substantial amount of discordant peptides. And I was curious if you had broken it down into what kinds of PTMs you're seeing. Are you seeing um, you know, modifications? Are you seeing splice variants? Um, can, you, can you give us some insight into sort of the bulk behavior um, that this assay suggests is going on? That's a great question. I did not look at that. Um, that's a really good idea to look at that. Um, I, I just don't know. It, my guess is that there are probably not a lot of PTMs because usually PTMs are present at a low stoichiometry. So uh, I was surprised to find that methionine oxidation, um, I guess methionine oxidation could happen a lot more commonly. But you know, phosphorylation of tyrosine residues, for example, is usually at a, a small fraction of 1%. And that, we know that's true for acetylation as well. So my guess is that they're probably mostly related to uh, uh, proteolytic processing um, or potentially also related to uh, alternative splicing, but I just don't know the answer for sure. But that's a great question. I'm cognizant of wanting to give other folks a chance to ask some questions. Um, I'll ask one that I think might be quick. Um, you know, you talked about sort of individual omic types and um, COVID prediction as well as multi-omic. And um, I guess I wonder, um, and, and it looked like there wasn't that much of a difference there. Did you kind of look at whether signal was redundant between them? And if so, was there something you learned about kind of which omic types are more redundant with each other? Mm, that's a really interesting question. I didn't look at that. Um, that would be easy to look at. You could look at, well, as part of the rest of the paper, we looked at correlations between molecules. Um, I don't remember what we found with that, but you know, if you find that one omic set is not or less correlated than the others, then then maybe that's the set that you want to target. But I just don't know the answer to that right now.
I know we have like two minutes left. Would anyone else like to ask one last question? Okay, if not, then let's thank Jesse uh, for taking time here today to share his work. Thank you all, I really appreciate it. And I think you have more meetings coming up and you've had some meetings. So thank you so much for spending time with us to share your expertise. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity, I appreciate it. So.